the formation and alteration of minerals in the solar nebula and on meteorite parent asteroids. He's also working on the application of inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry for geologic studies. In addition, he's studying the extent of HG isotopic fractation in natural systems. This project represents a potentially new stable isotope system with applications in meteorics, geology, biochemistry, and environmental studies. Second speaker is Mr. Chris Litwicky, Lewicky, Chief Asteroid Miner, Planetary Resources. Chris Lewicky performed system engineering development and participated in assembly, test, and launch operations for both Mars missions. He was flight director for the rovers Spirit Up and Opportunity and the surface mission manager for Phoenix. The recipient of two NASA Exceptional Achievement Medals, Lewicki has an asteroid named in his honor, 13609 Lewicki. Chris holds bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Arizona. At Planetary Resources, Mr. Lewicki is responsible for the strategic development of the company's mission and vision, engagement with customers, and the scientific community, serves as technical compass, and leads day-to-day -day operations. Last but certainly not least is Mr. Rick Tumlinson, co-founder of the Space Frontier Foundation and Orbital Outfitters and the Texas Space Alliance. Um, named one of the top visionaries and one of the top 100 most influential people in the space field by Space News, Mr. Rick Tumlinson is the co-founder of the Space Frontier Foundation. Mr. Tumlinson worked for noted scientist Gerard K. O'Neill at the Space Studies Institute founded the New York L5 Society and was a key player in starting the Lunar Prospector Project, which uh, discovered hints of water on the moon. He also helped pass the Space Settlement Act of 1988, testified before President Reagan's National Commission of Space, and was a founding trustee of the XPRIZE. Over the years, he has been a lead witness in six congressional hearings of the future of NASA, the U.S. space program, and space tourism, including testifying before Senator John McCain and the space, Senate Space and Technology Committee on the Moon, Mars, and beyond program. First up, let's all welcome Professor Dante Loretta. Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. There was a time in my life when I actually got to do all that stuff, like look at meteorites and analyze their chemistry in the lab. Uh, but that all ended uh, 2011 when uh, OSIRIS-REx was selected as uh, the third mission in NASA's New Frontiers program. And before we go through a movie that just kind of shows you what we're up to on OSIRIS-REx, I'll give you a little bit of the backstory. Uh, so 2011 is when we won the contract from NASA. 2004 is when I started dedicating uh, most of my time to convincing NASA to fly this mission. So it took us seven years of proposal development and uh, you know, winning and losing different stages of, the, of the, uh, these competitively selected mission lines until finally, uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago, we won the New Frontiers program. Uh, so it's a partnership. Uh, we're, we're led at the University of Arizona as the principal investigator. NASA looks to me for really three top level um, items. First of all, I'm responsible for maintaining the scientific integrity of the mission. When you get into a system that's this complex, you're constantly trading off performance versus mass, schedule, power, dollars, people, sanity, etc. And so my job is to keep the science uh, in, intact and, and maintain the integrity to the largest extent possible. But then they give me the, the additional burden of maintaining a, a PI managed cost cap. So they gave me $803 million. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a fixed price contract between me and the federal government. So I'm going to deliver OSIRIS-REx for that price. That doesn't include the launch vehicle. That gets to show up as what we call government furnished equipment. Uh, and it's going to be an Atlas V 411, which is uh, one of the, the launch vehicles that you see here to start off our movie. Uh, we're partnered with uh, Lockheed Martin Space Systems uh, based in Littleton, Colorado. They're building the spacecraft. They're building the sampling mechanism, the sample return capsule, and they'll fly the spacecraft. They'll do primary mission operations. At Arizona, we're building the camera system. We've got three different imagers that are being built at U of A. We have the Science Processing and Operations Center, so we'll command and um, uh, plan the observations for all those instruments as well as process all the data and ultimately select the site to get the sample from. And then our third prime partner is the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And that's where our project management is, our system engineering, safety mission assurance. They're providing an instrument as well. And then I should also mention our host institution, Arizona State University, is a partner on OSIRIS-REx, and they're providing a thermal emission spectrometer 
in fact, in the ISTV4 building where half the conference has taken place, I think on the third floor is where that, uh, that team has their offices. And then uh, the Canadian Space Agency is providing a laser altimeter, and um, MIT, Harvard are building a student experiment called REXIS. That's an X-ray imaging spectrometer. And then also locally, we have uh, a company called Kinetics. They are our flight dynamics team, and that's a small company, much like Planetary Resources, a group of engineers who broke out of JPL and uh, formed their own company. And they, they, they're the ones that fly the spacecraft for me. Um, so let's, let's walk through the mission. We'll see what kind of time I have left uh, to give you some of the science highlights, and then uh, we'll move forward. So September 4th, 2016 is the date we're all marching toward. And in fact, on December 10th of this year, we have a fun um, occasion to celebrate. We're actually going to turn on our countdown clocks because it'll be 999 days to launch, and our clocks only have three digits on them. So, uh, but then every day when I come into the office, I'll see that clock ticking down. So we're going on that Atlas V. That's going to throw us into an interplanetary trajectory. See the Earth up there in uh, blue. OSIRIS-REx is green. And asteroid Bennu, which is called 1999 RQ-36, is white. Notice we get out to the orbit of Bennu, but we're not quite caught up with it. We're also not in the right plane. We need a six degree or inclination change. So we do that by an Earth gravity assist. We'll come back to the Earth one year later in September of 2017. And then after a deep space maneuver, we'll be on a ballistic trajectory to rendezvous with the asteroid. So we're a chemical monoprop system. Um, so we start our science in August of 2018. We're approaching Bennu. That's a 500-meter asteroid. We're roughly a six-meter spacecraft. Uh, and then during the approach phase, we do a lot of astronomical kind of science, looking at Bennu as a point source, trying to get its uh, light curve and phase function and other important photometric parameters like that. Our initial survey is just going to be a series of hyperbolic flybys over the asteroid. So here we're tracking the spacecraft uh, through the deep space network, and we measure how much Bennu uh, accelerates it as we do these close approaches, and that tells us what the mass of the asteroid is. And then we'll go into a detailed survey campaign. We have a visible and infrared spectrometer and a thermal emission spectrometer, and they're both point spectrometers with nice high sp spectral resolution. So we're going to just rock the spacecraft back and forth using our reaction wheels and use the rotational motion of the asteroid to build up the spectral maps. And that'll tell us things like temperature, chemistry, mineralogy, grain size, uh, and a lot of other important information about the surface characteristics. And we're going to repeat those maps uh, from seven different locations kind of around the clock on Bennu. We'll start at 3 AM, 6 AM, 9 AM, noon, 3 PM, 6 PM, and 9 PM, because we want to understand the thermal variation with time across the asteroid. We'll do a, a stereo imaging campaign. We'll image the north and southern hemisphere from complementary angles, plus and minus 30 degrees. And then we'll go into orbit around Bennu. And this is a really challenging thing. Here are some actual dynamic calculations of what the spacecraft orbit is going to look like. We have to stay in that solar terminator plane because the solar radiation pressure is buffeting us around. You can see that the orbital plane is precessing quite a lot as we go around that small body. And that is primarily due to that solar radiation pressure. But we'll get a great view of the asteroid here. This is what the field of view will look like with our map cam. Uh, and at that point, we'll have picked some sites that we want to recon up close. So we do these recon passes. It's a little tough to see here, but we leaving orbit. There's a red trajectory coming from the left. That white was a, an observing pass. So we'll do the same kind of spectral mapping strategy where we just slew our point spectrometers and get coverage of the site on the surface of the asteroid. And then we always return to orbit. That's our safe home. Uh, one of the biggest challenges on OSIRIS-REx is your navigation knowledge and your ability to predict where you're going to be in the future. You do that best when you're in orbit around the asteroid. So once we've got a site uh, selected, we're going to start rehearsing our ability to send the spacecraft to contact the surface of the asteroid. So we'll leave orbit. We'll hit what we call a checkpoint. That's 125 meters above the surface of the asteroid. We'll do a burn on the propulsion system. We'll drop down to a 30 meter altitude. We'll do a bunch of very high resolution images and then we'll get out of there. And then once we've convinced ourselves of our ability to perform those maneuvers in sequence and within the design parameters, we'll go ahead and deploy TAGSAM. That's our touch and go sample acquisition mechanism. It's a three meter long robotic arm with an air filter at the end of it basically. And we've got three bottles of nitrogen gas on the arm. So at match point, we do a final burn to match the rotation of the asteroid. So we're basically hovering over a single point on the asteroid surface. And we're approaching at about 10 centimeters per second. We've got a constant force spring in the, um, the lower arm portion there. We make contact. Here's some engineering tests in the NASA reduced gravity aircraft. We open up one of those gas bottles. 
uh, and we just blast the heck out of the regolith that's on the surface of the asteroid. It expands up and out, and that's basically an air filter that just grabs a bunch of the particles. And we can pick up things about uh, two centimeters or, or smaller in, in dimension. There's also contact samplers on the outer ring. So even if we just touch the asteroid and that gas doesn't fire or something goes wrong, we'll still get material off the surface of the asteroid. We measure the moment of inertia of the spacecraft before and after we do that, and that tells us how much mass we picked up. It's actually a very clever little physics experiment. Once we're happy that we've got a baseline sample, and that's 60 grams is what I've, I've signed up to deliver, we go ahead and put that tag SAM head in the sample return capsule, and then we wait until March of 2021 for a departure burn. Notice we were back at the orbit of the Earth in 2022, but the Earth wasn't quite there, so we have to go around the sun one more time, and then in 2023, uh, we get ready for Earth return. So we're hanging on to that sample return capsule until four hours before atmospheric entry. And at that point, we'll go ahead and separate it and spin it up. The spacecraft will do a deflection burn and be put into a stable heliocentric orbit. And we're using the same uh, SRC design that the Stardust mission used, which returned the comet particles from Vilt 2. And this is actual footage of the Stardust fireball as, as that SRC came in. So we're targeting the Utah test and training range. This will be September 2023 when these samples get back to Earth. Uh, and we're, we've got a lot of the team members that were heavily involved in Stardust SRC design, uh, entry, descent, and landing, and, and recovery. And so the ultimate goal is to get those samples into the Astro Materials facility at NASA Johnson Space Center, basically the same building where the Apollo samples are, where those Stardust samples are. And then we get to take a look at them, and at that point I probably get to go back to my life as a sample scientist and try to figure out what Bennu is made out of and what Bennu can tell us about the origin of the solar system, about potential resources in nearer space. We believe Bennu has got a lot of hydrated minerals like clay particles and a lot of organic material, the kind of thing these guys are targeting with their, um, their missions. So we're also looking for resources. We're a resource identification mission, and that's part of the OSIRIS-REx acronym. A lot of spectroscopy, as you saw, we got a couple great spectrometers on the spacecraft. So we'll be able to cover the wavelength region from 0.4 to 50 microns, almost continuously. We have a small gap where they hand off. Uh, but that's where we find the signatures of the organic molecules, the water-bearing molecules, uh, and all the other mineralogy that dominates the surface and has spectral features. And then the final part of OSIRIS-REx science is the security aspect. You know, we picked an asteroid that has what we call a relatively low delta V. To get to the asteroid and then get back, that's one of the prime uh, mission design constraints that we had to deal with. And that by virtue of being easy to get to uh, and come back to the Earth, the asteroid, it's very easy for the, a the whole asteroid to come to the Earth. In fact, Bennu has one of the highest impact probabilities of any known asteroid. It's on the order of one in 1,000 or one in 2,000 uh, chance. We can predict its orbit very precisely because we've studied it so intensely all the way out to 2135, where it will do a sublunar close approach to the Earth. And after that, it scatters dynamically, and we can't predict with any precision where it's going to be, and it becomes a statistical assessment, and that's where you get the impact probability calculation from. So uh, the highest probability impacts in about 2180, so you guys are all right, and as I like to say, don't go out and buy asteroid insurance tonight to cover yourself on that one. Uh, and then Rex is the regolith explorer. We are going to document the surface of Bennu uh, at sub-centimeter resolution, particularly in the areas where we're thinking about committing that spacecraft. You know, even just watching the video of Tag Sam touching the asteroid simulant in that reduced gravity aircraft, that's, that's the stuff of my nightmares, right? Because I don't know where that stuff that's not going in the filter is going to end up, and that's one of the things that we're studying very intently right now and uh, trying to understand. How do we make, how do we interact with an asteroid surface? There's so many unknowns. The only uh, group that's ever done it is JAXA with their Hayabusa mission, and that didn't go well. Uh, and so we want to learn everything that we can from that mission and make sure that we touch that asteroid surface, we fire that gas, we get that sample, and we get out of there with a functioning spacecraft that can bring us back home. Good? All right, thank you. All right, next up is uh, Mr. Chris Lewicki, Planetary Resources. Hello, everyone. Excited to be back here again at Space Vision. Uh, not included in my bio, and uh, uh, many of you probably aware of, I uh, was a STEDS member myself, uh, and it was a, probably about half a lifetime ago uh, that I started getting involved in the national organization and the 
uh, national conferences uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, so I always uh, like, let's see, are you seeing the right thing up there? Uh, no? All right, stand by. Better now? No. The problem is uh, PowerPoint is going into presentation mode. Me. Survey says, fail. <clears throat> okay. Let's consult Microsoft. Yeah. God help us all. Try. Does. Anything? All right. Improvise. All right, so let's just get into it here. You can see this, right? All right. So Planetary Resources uh, was founded really to pursue what uh, Dante is working with the OSIRIS-REx mission, and that's resources, learning more about them, developing them, and really using them to expand the economic sphere of hum influence of humanity off the surface of the planet, beyond the geostationary belt, and into the solar system. And just like we settled the West and this state uh, and this country, uh, we did that in the pursuit of resources, and we did that actually through the use of resources. And in space, it'll be much the same. Um, in the near term, what that really turns into is prospecting. And we are prospecting for the very things like Bennu or 1999 RQ36 or uh, uh, 1998 JU3, the Hayabusa 2 is going to, I can't remember, JU3, uh, carbonaceous asteroids, uh, some of which the meteorite population of the 50,000 samples that Dante and other scientists around the world have analyzed uh, have been shown to be very rich in volatiles, uh, sometimes as much as 20 percent by weight uh, in, uh, in, uh, in volatiles including hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. But to really uh, kind of impress upon you why that's so important and how those resources can do really what everyone in this conference is so interested in about opening up the space frontier, I've got a, just a short video that, to kind of explain that concept. So, take a look. Imagine that you're on a road trip from Seattle to New York City. Now, what if there were no gas stations along the way and you had to bring all the fuel that you'd ever need with you? You'd have no room left for anything. Well, in outer space, the problem is even worse than this. 
After all, judging by the space race of the 60s and 70s, you might have thought we'd have colonized Mars by now. But we haven't. We're trapped at the bottom of Earth's gravity well, which is so deep that escaping the first 300 kilometers takes more energy than the next 300 million. It takes 50 kilos of propellant to deliver just one kilo to Leo. But four more would get you the next 35,000 kilometers. And two more, the last 300 million to Mars, to the asteroids, to anywhere in the inner solar system. But those four kilos to Geo each need 50 kilos to get into Leo first. And those two to everywhere else each need four, which each need 50. This exponential nature of the rocket equation has us stuck hugging our planet. Planetary Resources has had a Copernican shift in thinking. Travel beyond Earth's gravity well is nearly effortless. So, if fuel is sourced from space for space, we can avoid this exponential problem altogether. Fortunately, rockets run most efficiently on hydrogen and oxygen, which is just electrolyzed water and exists in near infinite quantities on asteroids. These future oil fields of space are also ultra-high-grade precious metal mines that lie unperturbed as the low-hanging fruit of our solar system, energetically closer than the moon, just waiting to be harvested. Mining asteroids could provide a fuel source 1,000 times more efficient than the brute force, bring everything with you approach used by the Apollo moon program. So how big is the space market when economics improve by 1,000 times? No one knows for sure. But neither did the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, nor IBM or Bill Gates at the dawn of their new markets. So this is really the big idea behind space resources. It's our ability to live off the land and to colonize and develop space the way that we have explored and developed and settled every other corner of our planet. Uh, let's see, this isn't gonna work in this particular format, so continue. So our approach to this is not to invent the exact mining machine that we'll go out to with an asteroid specifically, but uh, learn more about asteroids at, uh, more frequently than we're currently doing with missions like Hayabusa and OSIRIS-REx and near Shoemaker and Dawn, uh, but to get this into a commercial exploration program that's out there and prospecting for resources. And of course, uh, uh, 800 million or a billion dollars goes pretty far in NASA missions. Uh, that's not really an economically, commercially viable way to explore the solar system. So fortunately, there's been great advances in technology, and if you're willing to take some risks and uh, try some new approaches, we can bring that cost dramatically down. And that's what we're doing with our ARCID series of spacecraft that we're building actually right now uh, in our clean rooms in Bellevue. The the point of all these is to be able to pay, place an ultra low cost swarm of spacecraft at an asteroid and use that to learn more about not just one specific asteroid, but many. It's often that you have to go to many places to find the most viable uh, resources and understand how you would take the next step of starting to not only acquire those resources, but extract them to be able to store the uh, water or the metals that you would recover for them and ultimately deliver that to a point of need. This starts for us next year. We're launching our core technology uh, in the form of a CubeSat payload. CubeSats are a wonderful, relatively low cost to get spaceflight experience and get things into space. A lot of the stuff we're building ourselves, uh, much like Elon Musk is doing at SpaceX uh, in a, a style called vertical integration, where we can create our spacecraft the way that we need to source from our parts so we're not dependent on other vendors uh, or other kind of traditional government or aerospace prices or approaches to things. Uh, and this allows us to do things like create better star trackers, reaction wheels, compute elements, power sources, uh, and in the case of our Kickstarter, a better selfie camera. Uh, some of you probably were aware over, earlier in the summer we did uh, run one of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns. It was top 25 on Kickstarter, uh, but from a space standpoint, it was uh, the most successful uh, demonstration of crowdfunding to date. For us, it was an experiment, much like many of the things that we're doing. Uh, we didn't know if there was going to be a strong public interest in what we're doing, and as a private company, 
that's not our business uh, in terms of education and public engagement. But what we were able to demonstrate with Kickstarter is that there is a strong interest and, and people are willing to participate uh, not only personally but financially. So now we have 18,000 co-eyes and co-investigators and customers uh, that will be taking along with us uh, starting in low Earth orbit next year. We're also doing other things to engage everyone around the planet in crowdsourcing. As Larry Ellison said, the CEO of Oracle, the smartest people on the planet probably work for someone else. Uh, and to use our current tools that we have on the planet to actually access just a little bit of everyone else that's out there that's inspired by what we're doing, that wants to participate, but you know maybe they enjoy their current job or uh, they, uh, they, for whatever reason, can't be a member of our team directly. We're partnering with the Zooniverse and Adler Planetarium and NASA to do crowdsourcing to allow us to improve techniques that we use to detect asteroids. And we intend on taking these algorithms and employing them right on our spacecraft uh, to help both find new asteroids and navigate to the ones that we plan on visiting. Uh, so that's the end of the story that I'll share this morning. I'll let Rick tell you uh, the story of Deep Space Industries, and then I think uh, the three of us will take questions from everyone. This is how we work together. <clears throat> In fact, uh, while, while he's doing that, uh, somebody on the Hill we were talking to said at one point, said, look, if you've got one company, it's an anomaly. If you have two companies, it's an industry. So now we go into Washington and we have the industry position. Um, yeah, promo. Mm -hmm. Vision Master. Okay, cool. Start with the, right. that. <laughs> I got Chris as my AV guy. This is awesome. <laughs> Lots of experience. <laughs> so cool. Not a very good one because we can't get the thing working. But uh, just go for but it. But together we'll we'll fail with class. We will explore it together. So, all right. I'll just. I could tell them what we're looking at. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's a slide with. No. <laughs> well, we can go with the way you did yours. It'll be fine. Um, this one, no, certainly not. Microsoft got in here somewhere and sabotaged us. All right, we'll just do it. No, wait. Not this way. You're just doing this to screw with me now, right? <laughs> So by the way, I, I enjoyed Bill Nye last night, and um, I hope you guys did. Obviously, you did. Um, I'm going to address some of this stuff tomorrow morning. Uh, so tonight, or right now, I'm going to be talking with my DSI hat on, literally. Tomorrow, we're going to church. So if you uh, can get over your hangovers, because I heard those clubs last night. Like, my glass on my hotel room was like, boom, 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 boom. And um, so if you are awake, uh, come on in tomorrow morning, and I will address a couple of the interesting things that I thought Mr. Nye said that I might disagree with. And, um, you know, one of the, and, and there were other points in his talk where I would be like, he would put stuff up and it's exactly what I was gonna say. I'd be like, oh no, man, no, don't say that. Okay, so, right arrow, okay. Yeah, that's me. I did two, two presentations here uh, that, that are on the computer because I didn't know if we were gonna have the video. So it's gonna get a little weird a little later, I get a little weirder. Okay, so that's the threat that we're, um, that we're up against. 
And um, yeah, I just love the fact that there's a dinosaur in the corner who's like looking around going like, what? what? <laughs> it's over, dude. Now, as many of you know, um, we have the potential of, of these things coming along at random times. And no, PRI and uh, Deep Space did not conspire to put the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite down right after we announced our companies. Um, that would not really be something we wanted to do. Um, now, what's interesting is, statistically, these things happen once every certain period of time. Like statistically, if you roll dice, you will get a certain number once you know, every period of time or two times every period of time. That doesn't mean they can't hit two you know, within 100 years, one on the day after the other. You're still averaging two per 100 years. So it's an interesting question. And there's the promise. At $10,000 a pound, roughly uh, you know, what we're paying now to get into space, this stuff really gets valuable, especially the more processed it is. So once we have these things, we can do anything we want. We can build anything, any size. And that's the cool thing about space. And no, this is where he mentioned it last night. I was like, no, I'm going to leave it in. He ain't coming. So we got to get out there and we got to find them. And uh, these are the three of the, uh, see Chris, Chris, look. I put you in there, yay. Um, but we're looking, and, and I think there's some great, great things coming online. I think we're gonna be really finding more and more. It's almost probably gonna be exponential how many more we start to find. Um, and then we gotta go out there and do something about them. Um, maybe we don't hit them, maybe we go hug them and drag them around somewhere else, as you heard last night. Now the uh, NASA plan was to have this thing called the uh, Asteroid Redirect or Asteroid Return Mission. Um, it's dead. Uh, it, it's dead except for the videos, and um, I'm going to get in trouble for that, but what the hell. Um, you know, this idea, of, President Obama said, let's go out to an asteroid, send some astronauts. And, uh, and there's this thing, uh, again, not going to happen, not that way. It's not going to happen, okay? As, con as NASA was announcing the asteroid redirect mission, Congress was telling them, no, you don't either, and took all the money away. And so we're going through all these processes, and requests for uh, interests and proposals and things like that, but it's, it's, it's dead, Jim. Um, and this is about now, you hear that? <laughs> They're on it. This is also not, and by the way, this is one of our early images, which shows one of our dragonfly concepts going out, and uh, we're not gonna be going out and grabbing a little rock. It's, it's just too hard to find the logistics, et cetera. We're going to go grab pieces off of a big one. Uh, so if we don't really work together, uh, this is where it's all going to end up in the Congressional Space Garbage Can. Um, now, we are finding lots of uh, asteroids. And as I said, that's going to increase in, a, in pace. Um, the problem is we don't know what we're finding until we can get up and look at them. Because if you're looking at a, a, a highly reflective asteroid or a low reflective asteroid, and uh, and you are relatively sober, which, again, is not going to happen in this town, I gather. Uh, but they kind of look the same at a certain distance until you can get up close. Uh, when we look at one that's all metal, let's say the, the legendary, the uh, mythical platinum asteroid, or, or one that's just a pile of gravel, again, we, we can't really tell at a certain distance. Now, some of them we can if they're big enough. So there's the plan. I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie Spinal Tap. You must see this movie. That's where the line, I can turn it up to 11, comes from. Um, but in the, in the plan, in the Spinal Tap movie, there's like this plan where they're going to have this giant stone hinge come out in the middle of the rock concert. And so they have this 18-inch high model, and they're, they're looking at it, and it's all going to be perfect. And the problem is they didn't coordinate that with, this, um, with the, uh, the, the builders. So when it actually happened, that's what happened. And it's this great moment in the movie. And the thing is, if you don't know what you're going out towards, if you are going to send astronauts out, you're going to put on this big, dazzling show with what I call the Jiffy Pop thing, where they wrap a bag around it and they peel back the Jiffy Pop, and there's the asteroid stuff on the inside. And then they, they, they call PRI and, uh, and Deep Space and say, afterwards, here, you can have what's left in the popcorn thing. You know? So 
Um, if you're going to do something like that and do a big spectacular, really don't want this to happen. You kind of really want to know what you're, where you're going out to. So the question is, are, are we dealing with solid rocks? Are we dealing with gravel piles? We just don't know. So we've got to go out there and uh, get up, get up uh, personal. So this was the part where it gets technical again. And I am going to screw this up. Um, we will see how this works. I think he said, I love doing this. There we go. Make video go now. So here's our video, because you have to have a video or you're not a real company. What will tomorrow look like? Our world is at its limits. And yet we all want more. And why not? Why shouldn't the future be better than today? But where will it come from? Simple. Our tiny planet sits in a vast sea of resources, including millions of asteroids bathed in the sun's free energy 24 hours a day. The same rocks that could fall from our skies also contain everything we could ever need, both out there and down here. It's time someone sees the opportunity. <laughs> Space Industries. Deep Space is a new kind of company with a new kind of plan. We don't build rockets. We don't do astronomy. We are explorers and harvesters, makers and suppliers. As they say, timing is everything. And for space, right now is the time. In fact, some of the planet's most successful people are placing their bets on this new frontier. Meanwhile, NASA and others are planning new missions to the moon and Mars. With new space facilities in free space, joining the billions of dollars worth of communication satellites already in orbit. And as they reach beyond Earth's orbit, deep space industries will be there with the fuel, air, and materials they will need to succeed and grow. DSI has assembled an international team of well-known experts and young innovators who are building on our space legacy and creating new technologies and approaches to open the frontier. We will develop and prove ourselves in three areas. Exploring and prospecting for asteroids, harvesting and returning asteroid materials, and processing those materials for use in space and on Earth. Our early systems will be small and largely off-the-shelf components re-engineered for deep space. We will hitch rides on much larger missions with multiple ways to get into space, where our job really begins. With mission costs so low, we'll be able to attract commercial sponsors and build fleets of vehicles to assure our success. Early markets will be satellites in need of fuel, government outposts and commercial facilities, and missions between the Earth and the Moon. As we gain expertise and develop our systems, we will grow them as the frontier grows so that when the time comes, DSI will be ready. We will be the gas station, the oasis for air and water, and the building supply center for the frontier. This is a long game, perhaps the longest ever. While we earn our way, the long goal is to create a better future for all of us through space resources. When the first asteroid is mined, deep space will be there. When the first space power plants come online, Deep space will be there. When the first space colonies are built, deep space will be there. We can have it all. I think there's a bad man recording. We can have an amazing future. The resources of space will lead to a new renaissance, both in space and back here on our precious Mother Earth. We are deep space. The frontier is coming, and our time is now. There you go. So anyway, that's our video. And let me get back into the show. Make video go now. So what we did in our company was we assembled a, a team, 
and uh, we have, I think, one of the smartest teams around. Uh, Dr. John Lewis is our chief scientist. He wrote the book, literally wrote the book, Rain of Iron and Ice and Mining the Sky, that inspired both of our companies, and it was a good friend of all of ours. Um, and um, we have a lot of really good people that cross over into mining. We have people involved that are advisors that are working on undersea mining, uh, different kinds of engineers. Uh, and of course, as you saw, we have artists and graphic artists. It's what I call a renaissance team. And it's, it's really, really good. We have uh, uh, even your uh, retiring chairman is on our, our, our team, Michael Zwak, who I call Zwak. But um, he's on our team as well. And uh, it, it's just a great group of people. Uh, we're working on front to back. We're working on the whole vision, how you find them. The one thing we're not doing is the telescopic survey, the astronomical types of activities. We're starting after that and going forward. I'm going to roll through these fairly quickly because they were just covered in the video and these were my backup. By the way, we are looking at some planetary defense scenarios. Fireflies, uh, by the way, are about the, uh, there are 6U, CubeSat, two laptops, something like that, fairly small. Um, but we thought about stationing some of these on orbit and if something came in with the realm of the solar system past certain criteria, we could uh, launch on, on demand and go out and uh, look at them. Um, this is one that I'm showing you guys for one of the first times that's come out. Um, and the idea is to carry small craft out and create a mothership scenario. Um, these would be 3U or any combination of uh, uh, probes. And, um, and we made up university names because we didn't want to be too favorite, you know, piss somebody off. But basically, it, it could be quite interesting. Um, again, dragonflies and the harvesters. Some of the early revenue comes from the data, sample return, tech development contracts, corporate sponsorships, communication satellites. Again, these were covered in the video, so I'm kind of going through them fairly fast. Uh, and there's a lot of details. And, and since I know you're all very wealthy college students, uh, if you want to give me a call and talk about investing, uh, that's cool. That'd be like no pizza for 10,000 years, but you know we'll take it, uh, as long as you're qualified. Um, now, some of the goals we need to uh, achieve, no matter whether we're working for government or the private sector, are some of these kind of activities. We need to know uh, what they're made of, what they rotate, uh, what their rotation rates are, what their shapes are, um, the orbits, uh, things like that. And we need to find these things out no matter what we're doing, whether it's science, whether it's uh, resource utilization, it doesn't matter. We need to know these things. So. We want to look at different kinds of missions. Uh, flybys, which just kind of zoom by and take a picture. Rendezvous, which basically means uh, getting close to the object and uh, becoming fairly intimate with it without necessarily touching it, kind of getting into an orbit uh, with it, long loiter. Um, and then the mothership, uh, CubeSats, Sprites, Chipsats, whatever you want to call them, uh, getting in there and just spraying it with all kinds of things and having smaller vehicles that deploy from the mothership and then getting into sample returns. Um, now, we need to do this in the lowest possible cost way, but the highest possible return. And our proposal is that we work with the government and the private sector jointly uh, to achieve our goals. In other words, we, they need the science. Uh, we need some industrial science. Planetary defense is a national level goal, international level goal. Uh, we believe we can work together. And if we do it the right way, we can do it in a way that is repeatable and begins to build an industrial infrastructure without which nothing we want to do in space is possible. So we're calling it New Neo right now. If somebody comes up with a better name, that's great. Um, I know that's redundant, but it's still fun. Um, and the idea is to build on what you just saw with SpaceX and what you saw with orbital sciences. There was legislation put in place that a lot of people worked on for many years that made that possible. It wasn't like Elon just showed up and go, hey, I'm going to go fly to space station. Um, this was like one of those 25-year overnight success stories. There was a lot of battling that went on to create the legislation that made that possible. And we can repeat that by setting up a situation where the government partners with the private sector in the development of technology. There are milestones that we all meet. And once those are met, then we can move into a pay for services a transition. So you're catalyzing an industry with multiple players. We have multiple companies, organizations working on doing these things. And then we can move into a competitive marketplace. The agency has its own needs. They can work with us on the tech development. And we can uh, work on uh, projects ourselves. We can, you know, Elon, for example, 
could build seven seats into his vehicle as long as he can carry the three or four astronauts that are being, you know, they're paying for the ride, then he can use those extra seats for whatever he wants. And that's the kind of thing we want to do. Everybody has their plan. I think I spelled shadow the wrong. Um, but everybody wants to go to their own place. We have private companies like Golden Spike, Shackleton, and others that are going to go to the moon. SpaceX, Mars One, NASA, they really want to go to Mars. That's what they're after. We have our plans. And if we all work together, everybody can win. And that's what we're about right now. We may be fiercely competitive in, in our own industrial uh, projects or looking for investors or sponsors, things like that. But we're an industry and we're a community and our goal is settlement. And we all have to work together to make that happen. So that's all I got. Thank you. Questions? Hi, uh, this is a question for Chris and Rick. Um, how do you see the two of your companies interacting in the future when you start launching, surveying, and missions beyond that? And where do you see the differences in your goals as companies? Um, I don't know, we can probably give a joint answer. Is this one on, or? Yes. Everyone, you hear me? OK. Um, as Rick said, it, you know, it's an industry. Um, there's the, I absolutely love that there's competition and multiple things going on. It, uh, it, it's really exciting. It focuses us. It uh, defines, um, you know, not just how this is a one-off stunt um, in terms of uh, getting into space and doing things, but how do we make it into a sustainable industry and business that plays with the rest of the world economies just like everything else does. And um, you know, part of that is how do we stand apart from each other, how do we leverage each other, and then how do we work with an industry as a whole. So as things get going, we're looking at the start of things right now. But if you imagine uh, however many years out that this actually takes to become an established industry, there is no way that this is even, you know, even the subject of one industry, a resource industry. It's going to be uh, every industry that we have here on Earth from resources to energy to communication to tourism to research um, to uh, production uh, and you know probably even entertainment uh, at some point. So all of those things kind of bit by bit are in this second space race uh, kind of going forward um, and I, it'll be just kind of like the rest of the planet works and uh, it's getting started right now. I agree with Chris. Look, you. Um, when automobiles came online or aircraft came online, you didn't have one manufacturer. You know, you didn't have just one company. We aren't all driving Fords, thank God. Um, you know, and, and that's the way it's going to work in our industry. There is competition. It really does. It kind of keeps us alive, keeps us like, oh, those guys, oh, you know. Oh, they got a press, oh, they're doing this. Oh, they're flying. Oh, let's go, guys. Come on, come on. So that really helps. Um, you know, it'd be like if you had one university and one football team, like, you know, they'd all be out, you know, having beers every night and they wouldn't be practicing because they got nobody to beat, they don't care about. So I think that really helps. And also I want to extend that a little bit and talk about the government role in there, in that we are at an interesting transitional time where the government is doing its research and moving ahead at its pace. And then here come these guys talking crazy stuff, you know, and we're like, ah, we're gonna go fast, we're gonna do, we need them both. We all need to work together in different ways. Um, we need their support. They need us to be able to be nimble, to provide lower cost solutions as government budgets get tighter. And in the meantime, there's almost like an insurance function that goes on where who knows what we will do or not be able to do. They're moving ahead, doing their thing, uh, and we'll all be able to support each other. Sir, did you want to add into that? And just to, uh, you know, highlight, I'm not the government. Right. I work for, oh, yeah, that's right. I know, but I work for the University of Arizona. We happen to have $200 million in government contracts for Osiris Rex. So, but we're service providers. We're building a ground system. We build cameras. We, we provide the science. So, you know, Chris and I, Chris is an alumni of our program. He, he cut his teeth uh, with Bill Boynton, who's my mission instrument scientist. So one of our proudest alumni. So, uh, but we, we go out and we sell our services. That's what we do at the University of Arizona. I run it very much like a business and we targeted this opportunity at NASA and it took uh, seven years. 
to win it, but now we've got a, uh, another 10 years to go on the project. So don't forget that. NASA, especially the Discovery and New Frontiers programs, is thriving on competition, right? And it's a great idea that emerged about 20 years ago. Were you on Pathfinder? Did you work uh, at U of A? Which one? With Peter when he was building the Pathfinder camera. Mars Pathfinder kind of kicked that off, and I'm a huge advocate. I go to Capitol Hill all the time, too, and what I always tell them is push the competitively selected programs because the science community defines the priorities, and then you do get your best value for the money. We spent probably $10 million between Arizona, Lockheed Martin, and our other partners to win that contract. So um, it was a long view strategy to go do that. And uh, we welcome new industries because we can provide a lot of the stuff you guys are going to need. Mike Mongo, Icarus Interstellar. And I have, uh, uh, this is the first conference I've been at with a lot of college students. I've, I've done three presentations with conferences with you this, this year, Chris. And I am now hearing uh, constantly on the floor in the last two days, how do I get involved in particular with asteroid mining? So if you were a college student today, how, what would be your recommendation to begin interacting with planetary resources and deep space industries? Um, both of us have a lot of uh, the young people on our teams and uh, you know we uh, in our in our company we have a thing called special projects division um, which is basically where we try out people that are just graduates just coming out of school um, and, and work you know with them and that's also where we try out our new crazy ideas so the secretary can disavow all knowledge be like oh it was those guys you know and, and so uh, but in the meantime we get to do both and uh, like I said Michael Swack is involved with that I think uh, Eric is involved with it, uh, and a few other folks from SEDS are involved with that. The other thing to do is don't, if you're going to be planning your career, first of all, get some business savvy, uh, do business degrees. You know, this is like in the fine arts where, you know, where you're talking to an actor, a bunch of actors, they want to be actors, and like, what do you do? Get a real, get a real degree that you can work on. So get, get some business savvy. There were some previous lectures about that. Um, Look ahead at the engineering technologies that are not being covered right now. Um, I walked over here with some people this morning um, who were all about rocket propulsion. Um, that's great. I personally think that one's kind of getting handled right now. What we need are the kinds of technologies that, are, that start at LEO and go outward, and that would probably be thinking ahead. Like, what do you do with, help us do with these rocks when we, when we get them back? Or, how do you do propulsion into deep space, solar electric propulsion, things like that. So think ahead, get some business expertise under your belt, um, and give us a call. Uh, much of the same comments. Um, yeah, I, as Dante had said, I was you know, a, a product of the environment at the University of Arizona, which was absolutely wonderful. Uh, my freshman year, uh, when I was elected vice president to the University of Arizona said my first job well, it was the first meeting I went to I got elected vice president so. um, And then my charter was to go out and get speakers and the first speaker's door that I knocked on was professor Bill Boynton uh, We had a conversation about whether he would uh, talk about the mission that he was currently on we settled that quickly uh, And then had a conversation then I ended up getting a job offer um, Kind of from there on and getting involved in SEDS and space grant and all of the different activities as a student that were not classes, uh, stuff where I was working with uh, different people from different disciplines, uh, working on projects, kind of home growing that entrepreneurial experience about how do you convince this group on campus to let us use this thing for free? Uh, how do we get this donation from this local company to allow us to have pizza night? Uh, how do we figure out how to get funding to come to the conference today? Those are all kind of useful skills. And at the end of the day, it's all interacting with uh, and making yourself valuable to other people. So, you know, certainly do very well in your classes, but it, it's about much more than that. It's about the, uh, the hands-on experience that you have, and not just that hands-on experience that the classes give you, but what you can do outside of that. When we uh, bring in students at Planetary Resources, and we have, um, you know, it varies from, you know, maybe a fifth to uh, as much as a third of our total staff are actually uh, college students, graduate students, 
uh, and recently even high school students uh, we're bringing in from local magnet schools. Um, and they all have this hands-on project experience and uh, certainly coming into the company get a little bit more. Uh, so those are the things I would recommend. We had a blog post written up on this on just uh, you know how to make yourself interesting to an employer. Uh, and it's about going out there and doing things and taking initiative and, and leading stuff and making things happen. Uh, so that would be my suggestion uh, on how to uh, get involved as a student. There are, of course, lots of opportunities to be that aren't as an employee or an internship with the company. Um, uh, and just uh, sign up to the mailing list and stay tuned for those as they come up. Okay, thank you. Um, and sort of a follow-up related to um, your responses. My question is for any of the speakers, but I work with some junior high and high school students, and uh, one of the problems that I've seen with some students that was kind of concerning to me, um, I don't know if you want to call it a sense of entitlement or whatever the factor is, but when I'm speaking about, you know, the future of this industry and spacecraft, uh, rocket design, different things, some of the responses that I've gotten from the students are comments along the lines of, well, why would we have to do that in this country or why would we care, kind of, some, we could let someone else do that or like another country or someone else will build that and we would buy that from them or buy the infrastructure in my mind this is incredibly disturbing like when you stop having the ideas and the innovation and creating here you know then what do you have that's valuable or to even come to the marketplace and so I guess my question is what advice would any of you have for working with students along this and I'm kind of driving people I guess for the future of commercial enterprise and industry um, here in our country and moving that forward what can be done to get people excited about that or get uh, uh, along those lines when these are the um, future students in our country when someone responds that way? Yeah, it's a good question and one of the things that I struggle with, especially in light of the big education cuts and the reorganization of STEM that took place uh, earlier this year, we're struggling with how to get our education programs back online and get them back out there. And, and I have some creative ideas that I'll hopefully be rolling out in the next few months uh, that you guys in. but. Uh, in terms of um, what do you want to do, the, the previous question, to get involved in asteroids, one of my previous hobbies is uh, gold prospecting here in Arizona. And there's a saying in the gold business, go where gold has been found before. So not to tout our own horn too much, but the University of Arizona is really the central of asteroid science right now. And I take that mission very seriously in the sense that we have a lot of students working on OSIRIS-REx. I got Eric and Nathan. Anybody, any other students here? Uh, remind me, uh, your name? Huh? Joel. My apologies, but he's in the back of our building and I don't get back there very often. But we've got dozens of students running around and, and I do everything I can to get people on. In fact, one of my management principles is to reward initiative. So if you come to me with a good idea. In terms of inspiring the next uh, generation, I've also been working on that. I've started an after school program at the local Boys and Girls Club. And uh, that's, a, that's a good t test audience because they're often in disadvantaged neighborhoods. And they're, they're not captive, like when you go to a classroom, the student has to sit there and do the thing or else, you know, they'll be in trouble. In the Boys and Girls Club, they can come and go as they want to. So we work hard and we field test a lot of the products to engage them. And they really like to tap their creative side and to understand how it's relevant to them. You know, one of the things that we find is they love iPads. And one of the first things they want to do is find out where their house is on Google Earth, right? And then I use that to show them, well, here's your house, and then here's asteroid Bennu, and here's where the moon is, and here's where all the other planets are. And it starts to click to them the scale of things because they saw us zoom out from their house to where they are. And then we do lots of impact cratering experiments and build your own comets. And to me, uh, we're tapping into a fundamental human desire uh, for a couple of things. First of all, is to understand where we came from. And that's a question everybody asks and answers in many different ways, philosophy or religion or science or what have you. But the other one is where are we going, right? And, and what is our future? And uh, you know, I believe our future is off planet and I've been working my whole career to make that happen. And so once you start to convey those, you, you tap into that the human spirit and human drive and I think the American spirit. I mean, that's what America was built on. We were all the, the wired people who couldn't sit still in their home countries, right? We had to get on those boats and, and go somewhere. And I still see that now with what, with what everything that you see going on here today. Um, uh, this often comes up, I guess, with space exploration, especially when you talk about taxpayer-funded space exploration. People ask why. You know, why are we doing this when, insert some other need for money. 
Um, and you know, maybe part of that is true. You know, we all have different priorities for doing things. Um, but with regards to space, I think it's a little bit of what uh, uh, Professor Loretta just talked about with um, realizing that we are in space already. We're on Spaceship Earth. And it's actually the space program that allowed us to realize that with Apollo 8 coming around the moon, seeing the moon or seeing the Earth for the first time as this thing. Um, and it was just out there in space, the, this pale, fragile blue dot. And our ability to be good stewards of this planet, our ability to manage everything that goes on on the planet, to navigate our packages, to communicate, to entertain ourselves, to do disaster recovery, track typhoons, all this type of stuff is enabled through technologies uh, that are either from a part of the research and development that was invested in this uh, or a direct result of things that are up in space. And uh, it's you know the continued doing of that that I think will allow us to continue this, this standard of living. And uh, don't get often uh, the opportunity to call out Bill Gates, uh, but uh, I'll do that today. Uh, Bill Gates is often, you know, asked, he's like, well, you've got all these other wealthy, uh, you know, billionaires who are, you know, Richard Branson doing Virgin Galactic and Elon Musk to, uh, uh, doing uh, SpaceX and, and uh, Paul Allen and uh, Jeff Bezos and the people that we have invested in our company. You know, why aren't, why aren't you invested in space? And, and uh, Bill Gates had the, you know, he said, well, I don't see how that improves the, the world's problems. Uh, and I guess my response to that is that, you know, when the big one's coming and there's no resort except to just get off the planet and go somewhere else, we'll leave Bill behind. One more word? Yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, you mean, oh, up oh. to you. Um, yeah, here's, here's the thing. I, I, you're not going to get everybody in your class to change. There's never going to be a million person march on Washington for space. At the time that we began colonizing or exploring the new worlds, as we call them here, much to the sh chagrin of people who didn't know they were being discovered, uh, most people hadn't gone more than a couple of miles from where they lived. They could have cared less. They didn't know. So you're not going to win everybody. Don't, you don't even have to try that. But what you can do is contextualize it in ways that they can understand. Sit down with your class and, and, and um, you know, get a copy of, um, um, what was the one with the space colony that just was done? Um, Elysium. All right, have your class go through that and figure out what was done wrong and done right, or, or look at, or, or send your class to go see gravity and have them come back and write your report on what was done right, what was done wrong. Was Sandra Bullock's makeup perfect? I don't know, you know, but let's, you know, get them involved in that level in a way that they can understand. Also, part of your job is gonna be done for you in the next few months, because we're hitting a tipping point in the next few months, and the Branson flights are gonna start, and the x Corps flights are gonna start, and it's, it's gonna change. Your challenge next year, if you're sitting here a year from now, is going to be different and interesting because there are going to be people flying into space and coming back and talking about it. So it's going to start changing whether you need it to or not. But again, you're not going to get everybody. The person you do get is going to surprise the hell out of you in your room, in your classroom or whatever. Like tomorrow, I'm going to give a talk. We're going to go to church, as I said. And if I can get like one person out of, you know, all two people who come, um, to, to be excited and to have that moment and that change, that's good enough. That's good enough. It's a small percentage that changes the culture. The rest will come along for the ride. So. All right, I think that's all the time we have for today. Please give them a hand. All right, everybody, there's a lunch ticket in the envelope you were given. There's a food truck outside of ISTB4. Go feed yourselves.